Hello, I'm the Radical Reviewer. Tell me, has this ever happened to you? Ugh, I hate working here. It's such a slog. I feel unappreciated. And like, I don't have a say in anything. And it's like that everywhere. Every place I've ever worked is an authoritarian hellscape. Uh-oh, looks like he's living under capitalism. But what if I told you there's a better way? Introducing Participatory Economics. Wow, I love working here. I love having a say over how my workplace is ran via our workplace democracy. I love how we collectively decide what tasks we would each prefer to undertake with the interesting and empowering work and the boring and rote work being shared fairly amongst all of us. Yes, that's right. With Participatory Economics, you too could live in a self-directed, equitable, classless economy. Start your participatory economy today. Certain terms and conditions apply. In order to start a participatory economy, you must take over your current workplace, removing its current capitalist owner, then destroying the coordinator class, which exists between the managers and the workers, by democratically deciding the empowerment level and onerousness of every task at the workplace, so that balanced job complexes can be developed through the divvying up of these tasks equitably amongst all of the workers, of course, with a mind towards the skill and preferences. Then, adopt an iteration facilitation board to coordinate the desired outputs of the workplace as part of an annual plan, democratically coordinated between your workplace's workers. Hey, I know you. you that jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer, taking a look at No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World, by Michael Albert, Zero Books, 2022. Now, that little commercial thing was totally poking fun at the initial complexity of participatory economics, this new economic system that this book proposes. However, I do actually find the idea very interesting, and the stated results promising. So without further ado, let's learn about this bossless new economy for a better world, starting with chapter one, values for a better world. Now, if you've checked out Albert's other books or speeches or debates or podcasts regarding participatory economics, then you know that he starts this journey of developing a new economic system by trying to figure out what our values are. To ensure that the structures of our new economic system, the way it functions, are designed in such a way that they promote our values. And, well, the start of this book is no different, with Albert laying out seven primary values he believes a better economic system should be built to facilitate. They are 1. A value for decision-making. In a new economy, how should decisions be made? Albert states, Everyone should have a say in decisions in proportion to how much they are affected by them. In a group making decisions, if you are more or less affected, you should have more or less say. Hey, you can't put that on your desk. We didn't take a vote first. But it's just a picture. It's not really impacting anyone else. Shouldn't I have full dictatorial say when it comes to putting this photo on my desk? Hmm. Well, if you say so. Hey, that's the shock to be for my work. Well, don't we have dictatorial say over what we put on our desks? No, that's not the value on our workplace. Our value is... Can, can you turn that down for a second? <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Our value is that we should have a say over decisions in proportion to how much we are affected by them. Oh, I see. And so it stands to reason that I get some say over if we play loud music if it affects my ability to work. However, I do love dying fetus. Perhaps let's talk with some of our other co-workers about playing music in the break room. Yeah, that would be awesome. Albert calls this value self-management. Two, a value for benefits and burdens. There are many benefits and burdens in society, namely what you give society in the form of your work and what you get back from society in the form of your income. Albert rejects some of the most common ways for receiving income in our current economies. He rejects receiving income based on owned property, bargaining power, and even rejects receiving income in proportion to what you contribute because of what he calls luck in the genetic lottery. Albert's solution is the following. We get income for the duration, intensity, and onerousness of our socially valued work. I make billions of dollars because I have a piece of paper that says I own this multinational grain conglomerate. <laughs> no making money from owning property. I make millions of dollars because I ruthlessly undercut my competition and exploit my workers. <laughs> no making money from bargaining power. Yeah, uh, I make hundreds of dollars more than the average employee at this granary because I was naturally born larger than the average dog, 
so I easily produce more than everyone else. <coughs> no making money from luck in the genetic lottery. Hey, uh, here folks earn income based on metrics they can actually control about their labor, namely the duration, intensity, and onerousness of our socially valued work. Albert calls this value equitable remuneration. Three, a value for human interrelations. When it comes to our relationships with others in society, Albert states, my well-being should depend on everyone else's well-being and vice versa. In order to maximize my profits, I need my workers working as hard as possible for as little pay as possible. I need to be able to cut corners, to put a squeeze on them, to pit workers against each other. Little things like unions just gunk that all up. Hey, uh, uh, yeah, in an ideal world, hell, in reality, my freedom is inherently connected to the freedom of everyone else. Albert calls this value solidarity. Four, a value for range of life options. Albert explains that we should maximize our options in life because if we limit our options, we might inadvertently miss out on options we'd prefer compared to what we have. I want to guarantee that I make profit, so my product must involve very little risk and have mass appeal. At least, that's how I run my, uh, what do I own again? Was it a major record label? Or, or maybe I owned a department store. Or, or maybe a major movie studio, I forget. Hey, yo, uh, I'm an indie developer, and when you're part of this team, you know, we don't make a lot of money, but what we will make will be new and different. It certainly won't be for everyone, but for the people who like it, they will love it. Albert calls this value diversity. Five, a value for environmental relations. An ideal economic system would, of course, want to account for externalities in production that lead to environmental destruction. An ideal economic system would want to function sustainably. Our primary responsibility is to shareholders. We can't address our pollution in ways that negatively affect our profit margins. <coughs> Yeah, we value ecology. Our production, our infrastructure, waste management, all of it must exist in a way that cooperates with the environment. Albert calls this value sustainability. Six, a value for international relations. There was already a value for human interrelations. I feel like this might be retreading a bit, but I suppose it's good to clarify that this value functions on an international level as well. Albert states, what we value for our society, we should value for all societies. The goal is to promote peace and mutual aid, not just with your neighbors, but with all the societies of the world. Yeehaw, patriotic workers of America unite, brother! <coughs> workers of the world unite. Albert calls this value internationalism. And lastly, seven, a value for the applicability of our values. This value is essentially a dedication to all the previous values. Albert states, Society's benefits and burdens, its rights and responsibilities, should be for everyone. All is interdependent in a civilized society. It is impossible to reform any one thing without altering the whole. Albert calls this last value participation. Self-management, equitable remuneration, solidarity, diversity, sustainability, internationalism, participation. With our values combined, I am participatory economy. Chapter 2, Who Owns What? This is in regards to this pretty complex concept called property. Albert argues that the problem with property is that we often treat very different types of property the same. We might have a set of rules and expectations regarding what is called property when it comes to your home and your personal possessions, but when we apply those same rules and expectations to giant swaths of land, to natural resources, to workplaces, to things that many folks beyond the owner rely on for survival, then horrendous things happen. Albert argues that those larger forms of what we currently call property, these productive forms of property, should be controlled collectively, maintained like a commons. He states, all these productive assets are either gifts of nature, like warmth from the sun and resources from beneath the ground, or they are products of a long history of human creative activity, like technology, knowledge, and skill. They are parts of a natural and a built commons, which should together be respected and used responsibly for the benefit of all society. There is not even a thought or an invention which is not common property, born of the past in the present. 
Every new invention is a synthesis, the result of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics and industry. Albert's solution is this. We propose no private ownership of productive assets. Chapter 3, Who Decides What? This chapter is closely related to the first of our seven values, self-management, that folks should have a say in decisions in proportion to how much they are affected by them. When it comes to doing this within our workplaces, Albert recommends that workers come together to make decisions in something he calls a workers' council. He states, We propose that the workers' council is the whole workforce empowered to meet, deliberate, and tally votes to arrive at decisions when need be. But won't that take forever? Like voting on things? Having bosses and managers delegate decisions just streamlines everything, right? To this, Albert retorts, Imposed order hides and ignores people being alienated and even suffering inferior outcomes. It appears less messy only if we don't value the input that is excluded and don't count the occurring damages. Um, okay, sure, but what about expertise? Don't some folks just have specialized knowledge about a thing, and so they're in a better position to make decisions about it? To this, Albert retorts, To think experts shouldn't just offer their wisdom for others to evaluate and even learn from, but should themselves decide outcomes, would not only rule out collective self-management, it would also rule out even limited democracy. Basically, we don't want hierarchy, we don't want a vanguard, we don't want technocracy, we want self-management. To achieve this self-management, Albert explains that our decision-making processes will vary depending on the choices being addressed. Some things might be one person, one vote majority rule. Others will need to meet a certain threshold of support to pass, say two thirds majority. Some might need consensus or be subject to veto by those involved. Whatever it takes to secure self-management. Chapter four, who does what? So when it comes to how we create the goods and services of society, who the heck does what? Whether it's a capitalist economy, or what has been called actually existing socialism, more accurately called state capitalism, in both systems, things seem to get done like this. There are some folks who do the managerial type stuff and tell other folks what to do, and then there are working class folks who do the thing they are being told to do. Albert states, We call those who monopolize empowering tasks the coordinator class. We call those who do overwhelmingly disempowering tasks the working class. We claim this difference is so substantial that it defines a class division rooted in economic relations. If you are familiar with the Marxist distinction of classes based on their relationship to the means of production, you might, like me, think the coordinator class working class distinction is somewhat improperly used here. Although I think a coordinator class working class distinction exists and is severe, it is less severe than the capitalist working class distinction when it comes to the relationship with the means of production. It would be more accurate to call the coordinator class working class distinction a sub-distinction. I mean, what Albert calls the coordinator class already has been given another name, the labor aristocracy. At least that's how I see it. Either way, when we look at situations where the capitalist class is irrelevant, whether we're talking about so-called socialist countries or certain co-ops or worker-controlled workplaces within capitalist countries, it is this labor aristocracy coordinator class versus the working class distinction which seems to maintain hierarchy within the workplace. Albert's solution is the following. To eliminate the unwanted division of labor, we need to balance jobs so that we all do a fair share of empowering and disempowering tasks precisely so that we are all well-equipped and inclined by our circumstances to participate in decision-making. Let's look at a real-world example. Right now, I work as a dishwasher in the deli department of a grocery store. If we were to institute workplace democracy and yet keep the jobs within the workplace the same, the managers would, either immediately or over time, come to dominate the democratic workers' meetings. I would be super stoked to go to those meetings and have a say in how my workplace is run. However, my position in the workplace, that of being a dishwasher, doesn't actually give me a lot of decision-making empowerment doesn't give me a lot to contribute regarding workplace democracy. Now, I've talked about this with a few folks, some of whom say, dude, I don't want to have extra tasks empowering me to better participate at meetings at work. To be honest, even if it's more democratic, I kind of just want to clock in, do my stuff, get it over with, and clock out. Which is a fine sentiment. But you know, as Uncle Ben so often said, right before dying, 
With great power comes great responsibility. With the benefits and power of worker control comes some responsibility to wield that control. But I don't even think this has to be this huge undertaking. Let's look back at the dishwashing example. Let's say, because dishwashing does not provide me with very much empowerment within my workplace, perhaps I will also organize the ordering of new kitchen equipment, or contacting maintenance folks for repairs, or helping to write the schedule, or any of the many other management level tasks which will be divided up amongst all the workers. Then, there wouldn't be this divide in empowerment and know-how between the working class and the labor aristocracy or coordinator class within our workplace. All workers will be equally prepared to engage in the workers' council. Chapter 5, Who Earns What? Well, let's think about value 2 from our 7 values, that being equitable remuneration. Remember we got rid of earning income for property, or for bargaining power, and we even got rid of folks earning money from the economy due to luck in the genetic lottery. And so instead, we came to the conclusion that we should receive income for the duration we work, the intensity we work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which we work for our socially valued labor. This chapter elaborates on this value. For example, Albert explains that he uses this qualifier, socially valued, because working to produce something no one benefits from, or using resources, tools, and skills in ways inferior to how they could be used, is wasteful. It does not contribute to the social pie. It is not, or perhaps more accurately, it should not, be socially valued. Okay, so income based on the duration, intensity, and onerousness of our work. How the hell are we supposed to calculate that? Well, Albert names several calculating methods that could be used. For example, workers could receive an evaluation report. Or, if most workers in a workplace work under similar levels of intensity and onerousness, then they could simply receive income based on duration, on hours worked. There could even be an elaborate rating system, which creates several different levels of income amongst workers within a workplace. Whatever method is chosen, it will be chosen by the workers themselves, as part of self-management. Critiquing anarchists for being too structureless, Albert argues that such complex systems for facilitating incomes are required because simply declaring, we will operate on the basis of mutual aid, or we will have a gift economy where goods are distributed freely, is just too vague and leaves too much room for error. Although he probably has a point here, to a certain extent, funnily enough, Albert uses the example of a busy intersection to prove his point saying that there will be way more accidents if there are no structures in place to ensure folks follow the rules of the road. This example is ironic because it turns out the opposite might be true. Perhaps you've seen this video called Road Signs Suck, What If We Got Rid Of Them from Vox. With video footage like this from Exhibition Road in London, analysts can rate the severity of a traffic conflict based on the participant's speed and change of course. Before the shared space renovation, one pedestrian had to step back onto the sidewalk to avoid a departing car. Another broke out into a sprint to avoid getting hit by an oncoming van. After the shared space installation, traffic conflicts were less frequent and less severe on average, like this, where pedestrians wait for a cab to cross before continuing. Or this one, where a cyclist changes course to avoid pedestrians. I think this is exactly the type of argument that the mutual aid gift economy type anarchists would suggest. Regardless, I think this value of equitable remuneration via determining incomes based on duration, intensity, and onerousness can give us a lot to think about when it comes to our political groups, our volunteer organizations, unions, co-ops, or potential future endeavors. Chapter 6. Who likes markets and central planning? Before getting to the next chapter, which looks at how participatory economics calculates the production and consumption of goods and services, Albert asks if market economies or centrally planned economies could accomplish this task without violating our values. Albert defines central planning as an economy where a planning agency seeks and assesses information from workers and consumers. It proposes inputs and outputs for all economic units. The units then consider their instructions. They either carry them out or they register problems they think will prevent their doing so. The central planners then assess the predicted problems and issue new instructions and the cycle repeats. It arrives at its conclusion when the planners no longer seek responses but instead issue orders. Albert rejects central planning for violating self-management, violating democratic worker control. 
Albert defines market economies as an economy where buyers and sellers compete to advance their own separate interests such that prices and budgets arise from the competitive interactions of the buyers and sellers. Albert rejects markets because they destroy equitable remuneration, self-management, solidarity, and even the ecology. Basically, we cannot rely on markets or central planning to calculate the production and consumption of goods and services in our economy because they can't do so without violating our values. This leads us to Chapter 7, Who Allocates What? This chapter explains how a participatory economy will calculate the production and consumption of goods and services in our economy. Let's make our way through this process chronologically. I've broken down this into the five steps mentioned in the chapter, so let's have a look. 1. Workers' councils, individual consumers, and consumers' councils first access relevant data from last year. Meaning, these different actors look at last year's numbers, what was produced, what was consumed, and at what cost, so that they can begin to create their plan for the following year. For consumers, they use their income to determine what they can afford. Wait, income? What is this, capitalism? Well, no. As we already saw, under participatory economics, individual incomes are determined by each workplace doling out the average wage, modified by who has worked longer or harder or under worse conditions. But some things will have changed between last year and this year. New investments, new consumer products, new tools or methods of production, innovations from consumers' councils, workers' councils, university research, or perhaps even an innovation industry itself. So what helps everyone keep track of the changes in the economy from last year to this year? Enter, two, the same planning participants simultaneously receive information from the Iteration Facilitation Board. Basically, a participatory economy is all about consumers' councils and workers' councils coming together to decide what to produce and consume. The Iteration Facilitation Board helps facilitate the number crunching that process involves by announcing initial estimates on the prices of goods and resources and categories of labor, these estimates being based on last year's figures while taking into account changes in production or consumption over the year, and thus coming up with costs, or what Albert calls the indicative prices. With this new information from the Iteration Facilitation Board, consumers and consumers' councils make consumption proposals that take the indicative prices as estimates of true valuations of all the resources, equipment, labor, and good and bad byproducts associated with each good or service. Their expected budgets limit their consumption proposals. Indicative prices indicate expectations as to how much each item they proposed to consume costs from their whole income. The Iteration Facilitation Board takes those proposals and reports out disparities in supply, demand, social costs, and adjusts indicative prices accordingly. Of course, we want to be accurate with prices, to include externalities. Looking at secondhand smoke as an example, Albert posits, The first possibility is to implement restrictions that would reduce ill effects, such as no smoking zones. A second option might be to charge fees that cover the cost of ventilation methods and medical charges. A third possibility might be to alter the product itself to reduce its ill effects. A fourth possibility could be the more aggressive banning of the product entirely on the grounds that there is simply no way to reduce the ill effects sufficiently to permit its sensible consumption. 3. Planning participants also receive information from production and consumption councils regarding long-term investment projects and collective consumption proposals already agreed to in previous plans basically making sure everything is going well regarding long-term investments that were already agreed to. Looking at socially consumed goods, Albert states, If a pool is proposed in my neighborhood, or a new dam in my state, and if there will be beneficiaries beyond the area of the proposing council, then, in passing up the proposal, its advocates are looking for it to become a proposal of a higher-level council, with the hope that all who benefit at the higher level will also be in charge for its consumption rather than only a subset in the smaller proposing council paying the whole cost. 4. Planning participants optionally review changes in their own proposals made during last year's planning to see how much they had to scale down their consumption desires or their desires to improve their quality of work life, and to remember their past aspirations in these regards. They also look to see what increases in average income and improvements in the quality of average work complexes are projected for the coming year, and consider how they might best enjoy these gains. This is essentially the participatory economy version of personal finance. 
individuals looking at their workloads and consumption and expectations and goals. Five, finally, using estimated prices as starting indicators of social costs and benefits, planning participants develop a proposal for the coming year enumerating what they want to consume or produce, and also, if society warrants doing so, providing qualitative information about any major deviations from expectations. Each proposal then enters the mix with all the others. Feedback arrives and revisions are made. This occurs iteration after iteration until a final plan is reached. Okay, sure. But over the course of a year, folks are bound to change their minds, right? Like, this might sound crazy, but what if, over the course of a year, someone changes their mind about what they want? Albert responds, As long as consumer adjustments cancel each other out, We'll see who cancels who. Cancel each other out at some consumption federation level, production plans need not change. Of course, we can't always just say, eh, it'll come out in the wash, no big deal, if the yearly plan differs greatly from what actually takes place. Perhaps there is a more substantial change in the prices or workloads over the course of a year than what was initially proposed. In that case, as Albert explains it, a participatory economy could simply reassess people's overall expenditure, charging them accurately at year's end. Basically something like owing or getting money back on your taxes. Now, all this sounds like it could be doable, especially given the technology and means of communication at our disposal. In fact, speaking of technology and means of communication, why does this have to be an annual affair? Perhaps plans could be more accurate if folks just had monthly proposals that they adjusted as needed. Especially if access to prices and production information and product availability is as easily accessible as using an Amazon.com type user interface. You know, but with balanced job complexes, workplace democracy, and accounting for the ecology of the planet, rather than, you know, like, sending some cowboy hat wearing gazillionaire to space and then for some god-awful reason allowing him to return. Anyways, Albert concludes the chapter stating, Unlike in market or centrally planned systems where the outcomes are determined by elites with no attention to most of the relevant information or to most of the impact on others or to the wills of most people affected or to the merits of the methods utilized, in participatory planning, all these considerations are central. This is not introducing unnecessary complexity. It is addressing actual complexity responsibly. Chapter 8, Participatory Economics and the Other Sides of Life. This chapter is about what participatory economics is all about regarding things that aren't strictly economics. A cool thing here is that each subject discussed in this chapter is given a recommended reading if you would like a more detailed answer. Regarding the family, Albert states, What about family structures and children and things? Like, it... There's no children in participatory economics. <laughs> it's too I mean... complicated, so I decided to rule it out. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was, that's a joke. What he actually says is, a new economy would also have to facilitate, where it can ship to call for it, a fair and equal distribution of caring work. We need to win new kinship because changes in other domains would not alone liberate sexuality and gender as fully as desired. We can then be confident, however, that such new kinship can support and be supported by participatory economics. Essentially, Albert is no class reductionist. He believes that this new participatory economy can support the liberation of sexuality and gender, but that radical action will still need to be taken on those fronts to achieve our desired goals. Regarding the environment, Albert states, A transformed ecology would say to economy, 1. You must account for the implications of your choices on me, the surrounding ecology, and how their impact reflects back on you, the human guests. And 2. You should be eager to abide ecological constraints and aims that arise from ecological wisdom but require economic attention. And how does participatory economy reply to ecology? By design and necessity, it says yes. Both capitalist economies and actually existing socialism, aka state capitalist economies, have been absolutely horrendous when it comes to the ecology. One of the greatest reasons for this is lack of accountability between those affected and those who benefit. Participatory economics attempts to alleviate this by, as we have seen, correctly accounting for externalities into the cost of production, by giving folks a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they are affected by them, and by having both producers and consumers come together in the decision-making process. Regarding art, Albert states, 
Like all work that is undertaken as part of one's social contribution to economic output, art must also incorporate the desirability of benefiting and respecting the will of others beyond oneself. Essentially, art will function like other industries in a participatory economy, such as having a workers' council and balanced jobs. Part of me thinks very highly of this. For example, rather than the film industry being beholden to the profit motive, with directors and actors and writers, etc., having to appease capitalist owners with safe investments, instead, directors, actors, writers, etc., will only have to convince others in their workers' council of the merit of their project, and so more creative, risky, inventive projects will stand a better chance of being funded. At the same time, though, I think about the punk scene, where you have folks living 10 or more to a house, constantly starting new side projects, forming bands, playing in several bands at once, some people busking and playing cafes, some playing shows in dilapidated venues or dive bars. Could this workers' council structure actually function in such a intangible, fluid, artistic community? I don't know. Chapter 9, Winning a New Economy, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. What is this rock and a hard place? Reform versus revolution. Albert argues, too much emphasis on respecting our limited present will preclude escaping our limited present. We must be bold. Too much emphasis on attaining our desired future will preclude gaining a foothold to get moving at all. We must be practical. Basically, we need to do both. For example, we can't avoid fighting for a $15 an hour minimum wage while we wait to revolutionize the entire economic system. But we also must frame our immediate goals as part of a trajectory towards revolutionary change. One of the ways to do this is to live our values. In this case being balanced jobs and equitable remuneration within our political projects. This might sound overwhelming like crazy hard to do within a capitalist system, but imagine it this way. Let's say that we live in a racist society. I <laughs> know, crazy, right? But, but let's just imagine that we live in a racist society. Now, if we want to create a political organization, it stands to reason that we would want that organization to be anti-racist, even if that puts us at odds with the rest of society. Similarly, if we want to promote values like classlessness and self-management within our organization, then we should live those values with balanced jobs, equitable remuneration, and all of that, both as we strive for immediate goals and as we strive for revolution. And finally, Chapter 10, Origins, Prospects, and History of Participatory Economics. This chapter is all about answering some frequently asked questions. Some ask if participatory economics is set in stone or adaptable. To this, Albert states, Our priority should be to improve our views, not reflexively defend them. We should realize that finding and fixing weaknesses is more constructive than robotically preserving against change. Some ask, why not support social democracy rather than participatory economics? To this, Albert states, social democratic capitalism is capitalism. We can certainly favor various short-run social democratic aims, as anyone sentient and caring ought to, but we should talk about them and organize for them as part of winning a fully new economy not as final ends in themselves. Some ask, why not support socialism or anarchism rather than participatory economics? To this, Albert argues that socialism, as a term, often confuses not only the rich, but working class folks as well, although that might be slowly changing over time. Of anarchism, Albert wonders if it actually proposes enough structures, enough institutions to accomplish its goals. Albert ultimately concludes, just as I think participatory economics fulfills the best aims of socialism, so too I think participatory economics fulfills the still more encompassing best aims of anarchism. When asked why participatory economics is not more widely known about, why it's not more widely advocated for amongst other leftists, Albert gives quite a few different answers. One is that leftists in general don't propose full-fledged economic visions, instead often sticking to critiques of our current system or proposing values, but not moving beyond that point. Next, Albert gives a reason I'm kind of skeptical of. He states, Their implicit or explicit allegiance to the idea that coordinator class members have innately superior decision-making wisdom and innately greater creativity for doing empowering tasks. AKA, folks in academia and leftist media or whatever are all coordinator class betrayers of the working class, 
and that's why participatory economics doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, maybe. Mm. The last two reasons I think are probably the most accurate, that many authors and activists are just far too busy with their own projects to give participatory economics the time and attention it might deserve. And, more frighteningly, perhaps a few too many authors and activists deep down don't think that we will ever actually get to a place where understanding a vision for a new economy will be relevant. And yet, Albert pushes forward, concluding that it would likely cause us to reconceive the ways we organize our own institutions and campaigns so that in time, we would no more tolerate movement organizations that embody corporate divisions of labor and market-oriented norms then we tolerate movement organizations that embody sexist or racist norms. Conclusion. Or, well, I've somewhat misled you here, because that's not actually how it ends. At the end of the review that I did for this ridiculous right-wing brain rot of a book called American Marxism, I'd said that I wished more leftist texts would conclude with such concrete, helpful guidelines on what a reader should do next. And we kind of get close to that with the end of this book. Not only does Albert finish the book by addressing frequently asked questions, he also provides a wide list of other recommended readings, and even says, If you send additional issues slash questions, maybe we can together make the experience of this book still more interactive, not least via the book's website. You can reach me at sizesop at zmag.org. I try for interaction as well with the weekly podcast Revolution Z, and still more interactivity at the online School for Social and Cultural Change at sscc.teachable.com. Awesome! If this video intrigued you, you could of course get the book for yourself, but you could also check out some of these other recommended readings and even reach out to Michael Albert himself. Now, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I actually already reviewed a book on participatory economics like, oh god, four years ago? Damn, I'm getting old. Anyways, uh, that book was called Paracon Life After Capitalism. Now, I, of course, can't help but to compare these two outings. While reading No Bosses, I'd initially favored Paracon because I thought it was a more concrete handbook for this new system. Something like trying to compare ABC of Anarchism to Anarchism in other essays. After having finished No Bosses, writing this script, and then reflecting on Paracon, I don't feel that way anymore. It's not just because Paracon is 300 pages long, while No Bosses is just over 200. It's not even that No Bosses came out this year, in 2022, while Paracon came out almost 20 years ago, in 2003. Although, those two factors are relevant. I feel this way because No Bosses certainly shows two decades of refining the delivery, the structure of the presentation, of this new economic system. Although many of the analogies and examples remain the same from one text to the other, this layout, from naming our core values, then explaining who owns what, who decides what, who does what, who earns what, then laying out how the production and consumption of goods and services in our economy are calculated, both for markets and central planning, and then a detailed look at the proposed participatory economic process, before finishing off with a look at some outlining factors and frequently asked questions and recommended readings, I've come away from this book deciding that this is the new handbook for explaining what is meant by participatory economics. So, if that interests you, then you should get yourself a copy of No Bosses, A New Economy for a Better World by Michael Albert. And as always, I'd like to thank my wonderful patrons. Your tremendous support has allowed me to get dog insurance, which is wonderful. You've allowed me to support other creators I couldn't otherwise support. Gotta love that. You've provided me with extra funds for books and dog toys and things like that. It's really awesome, and I appreciate you folks a lot. And if you like what I do here and you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash radicalreviewer. And if you're interested in radical theory, looking for book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the Radical Review. Thanks for watching. bullet in the chamber for your boss when you see him. So as it turns out, unless you're a young child or a prison inmate, you don't need anyone supervising you. People just come in and do their work on their schedule. Imagine that. People like us allowed to sell paper. Unsupervised. And yet, somehow it works. <laughs>